Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tibedi from the Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. And in this context, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the development of the enzymology, we discussed about the uh, different aspects or the of the enzyme properties and then in the previous module we have also discussed about the structure of the enzymes. So, we discussed about the primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure and quaternary structures. And in this particular module we are trying to understand and discuss how we can be able to produce the enzyme in the bulk quantities so that you can be able to use that for the different types of applications or for studying the different uh, aspects of the uh, particular enzyme. So, in this context, uh, so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about how you can be able to isolate the enzymes, uh, uh, whether the genomic sequences are known or whether the genomic sequences are not known, right. So, when the genomic sequences are not known, you are actually going to screen the genomic library or the cDNA library. And that's how you're going to get the uh, gene fragments of your choice and that uh, you can be able to clone into a suitable uh, expression system. Uh, similarly, when the genomic sequences are known, you can use the polymerase chain reactions and that's how you're going to get the uh, gene fragments and that you can be able to clone into the chain, uh, into the, uh, into the, uh, into the suitable expression vector and that you can be used for the protein production. Now, as far as the uh, scheme for the enzyme production is concerned, uh, you are going to first take the gene fragment, you are going to isolate that from the genome, uh, either of these approaches what we have discussed and then these gene fragments has to be digested with the restriction enzyme so that you are going to generate the cohesive ends and similarly, you are going to use the vector for and it is also going to be digested with the similar set of the restriction enzymes and that's how you are going to have the cohesive ends onto the insert. You are also going to have the cohesive ends onto the vector. Then you will going to put them together into a ligation reactions and that's how you are going to get the ligated chimeric DNA and that ligated chimeric DNA you are going to transform into the uh, suitable host and uh, that transformed uh, uh, suitable uh, that transformed host can be used for the protein production or the enzyme production. So, in this uh, particular type of scheme, you are going to use the different types of enzymes, you are going to use the restriction enzymes, you are going to use the polymerases, you are going to use the uh, uh, ligases and alkaline phosphatase. So, these are the some of the things what we have discussed in our previous lecture. So, we have discussed about the restriction enzymes, different types of restriction enzymes. So, type 1 restriction enzyme, type 2 restriction enzyme and type 3 restriction enzymes. And then uh, we have also discussed about the properties of the type 2 restriction enzyme which can be used for the cloning purposes such as the type 2 restriction enzymes are producing the uh, palindromic sequence, they are recognizing the palindromic sequences and they are actually generating the sticky ends. Now, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss more about the different types of vectors. So, uh, as far as the cloning is concerned, right, the cloning is uh, require the knowledge of two components. One, you are actually going to have the proper knowledge of the enzymes 
uh, which are uh, going to be used in the molecular cloning, so enzymes in the molecular cloning. Or you can also be able to use the different types of vectors and vectors are always being specific to the particular host. So you can actually have the vector which are for the bacteria, uh, bacterial system. Uh, you can have the vector which is for the eukaryotic system. So within the eukaryotic system, you can have the uh, vectors which are for the yeast. You can have the vectors uh, for the uh, for the insect cell lines or you can also have the vector which are for the mammalian cell lines okay and then also you have the bacteriophage based vector which are also going to be used for different types of expression studies so in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the different types of vectors and how you can be able to use them for the cloning of the particular gene so when we say about the vector vector is a is a, is, a, is a DNA which has two responsibilities. One, it has the ability to carry the foreign DNA. This means it should have the uh, instruments and it should have the region where you, you can be able to insert the foreign DNA. Then it should also have to have the ability to replicate in the host, which means hence to fulfill these responsibility, a number of properties are desirable, right? This means if you want to design a vector or if you want to analyze a vector, you should follow the certain criteria for uh, checking its uh, uh, suitability and as well as the uh, you can check the different properties. So what are the different criteria one can use for uh, choosing the good vector? So good vector should be of low molecular weight. The low molecular weight or the size confers a number of advantages. For example, the small size vector is robust toward the shear stress and it is easier to handle. In addition, the after ligation the foreign DNA into the vector, the size of the resulting recombinant DNA will be small and it will be easier to deliver the recombinant DNA into the host cells. Because once you generate the recombinant DNA, the recombinant DNA has to be transformed or delivered into the host and then only you can be used that for rec that recombinant DNA for the protein production or the enzyme production. So if the size of the vector itself is going to be very high, then the, when you put the rec uh, recombinant DNA, the resulting size is also going to be even bigger. So in that case, sometimes people also face the, uh, you know, the delivery issues like you cannot deliver that big DNA, okay. Then the post entry in the host should give the phenotypic change. That is very important, right? Another important feature is that the vector DNA should give you the additional phenotypic changes in the host cell so that the recognition of the transformed cells will be easier, which means it should show you some phenotypic changes like the cell should turn like green. So if you imagine that if I could easily be able to recognize the cells which are getting the DNA or which are not getting the DNA simply by the fact that the DNA containing cells are going to be green in color, right, or blue in color or white in color. So in that kind of phenotype is going to help me in terms of identifying the transformed uh, host. Then it should have the multiple cloning site with a unique restriction site. So a small stretch of DNA on a vector contain the restriction site for possible site for insertion of the foreign DNA and that is desirable because that is the place where you are going to cut the vector and you are going to insert the foreign DNA. Then it should be a high copy number. A high copy number is desirable and gives the high amount of DNA after growing the host cells. There are instances when you, you can avoid the high copy number like for example if the enzyme is going to be, uh, enzyme is toxic for example to the cell. So in those cases, if you take the high copy number, it is actually going to give you very high quantity of protein and that may actually going to kill the host, right? So in those cases, only you are going to go with the low copy number plasmid or low copy number vector. But in all other cases, the high copy number is desirable. Now, if I have to design a vector, what are the different components I should use? So there are minimum molecular component which are required to assemble the uh, vector to perform the function as a vector. For example, it should have the origin of replication. 
like other like any other replicating dna plasmid dna needs its own independent origin of replication to provide the replication start site to make the more copies it decides the range of the bacterial host strain can be used with the particular plasmid vector the plasmid containing the ori uh, region from the col e1 can be able to grow in limited bacterial species such as e coli in contrast the plasmid containing the origin of replications from the rp4 or rsf1010 can be able to grow in gram negative as well as the gram positive bacteria which means depending on the origin of replications you can be able to decide uh, the range of the host what you can actually be able to use then you also require the selection marker selection markers in the form of either antibiotic resistant genes or the enzymatic gene is giving the phenotopic changes in the host after the entry of the host so this is the uh, we are going to take a very you know many examples when we are going to talk about the screening of these transformed clones so that time you will understand how the different types of selection marker is actually helpful in uh, you know in uh, selecting the transform host then we also require the promoter so plasmid replication is host is performed by the host provided protein such as the dna guidase helicase and all that but protein required for conferring antibiotic resistance or the enzyme used for selection program is present on plasmid and as a promoter adjacent is required to express gene present on the plasmid dna in addition promoter is also needed to express the gene present on the foreign dna so when we talk about the vector vector could be of two types vector could be of cloning vectors and vector could be of expression vector okay so if you are talking about the cloning vector you re only require the origin of replication and the selection markers okay but when you talk about the expression vector because you also require the promoter So because the promoter is the region where the all the transcription factors and the, the transcription machinery is actually going to bind then you also require the promoter so if you want to uh, make a expression vector then it also should have the uh, promoter also we have different types of vectors so different types of vectors as vector need to be replicated in different host, uh, host strain vector need the additional features to make it suitable for a particular host strain so the different host strain we are going to discuss is as follows like you are going to discuss about the bacterial plasmid phage based vectors uh, yeast vectors and then you are also going to talk about the mammalian vectors so let's talk about first the bacterial vector or bacterial plasmid so bacterial vector is also called as the bacterial plasmid so bacterial plasmid or plasmids are widely been used for cloning of foreign dna into the bacteria as a host strain different forms of the plasmid Bacterial plasmid is a double stranded circular DNA exists in three different forms if both the strands of the circular DNA are intact then it is called as covalently closed circle whereas if one of the strands has nick then it acquires the conformation of the open circle DNA during the isolation of the plasmid DNA from the bacteria covalently circular DNA may lose few of few number of turn as a, as a, as a result it acquires the super coiled conformation which means uh, bacterial plasmid can be present in the three different forms it can be uh, closely circular dna so it can it can be closely covalently closed circular dna which means this one it can be uh, open circular dna which is this one so it can be oc form or it can be super coiled form okay so in the super coiled form this uh, closely circular dna is also having the uh, getting the additional uh, turns and that's how it is actually going to have the super coiled dna and all these dna forms can be interchangeable to each other for example if you have the covalently circular dna and if you incubate that with the dna guidase the dna guidase is actually going to induce the additional turns and that's how it is actually going to be converted into the super coiled dna but if you take the super coiled dna and if you incubate that with the endonuclease it is going to you know cause the nick and that's how it is actually going to be get converted onto the super coiled dna and uh, so on so all these three forms like the covalently closed circular dna open circular dna or the super coiled dna are interchangeable to each other okay which means all of these can be interchangeable with the help of the different types of uh, enzymes 
Now this is the first bacterial plasmid which has been designed. So it is called as PBR322 and PBR322 is the first bacterial plasmid which has been developed by taking the different DNA fragments from the three different naturally occurring plasmids. So the, what are the different naturally occurring plasmids they have taken? So they have taken the PSC101, they have taken the fragments from the PMB1 and they have also taken the plasmid, the uh, the, uh, the region from the RSF2124 and that's how they will put together and that's how it is actually going to give you a, a vector which is called as PBR322. And this is I have given you uh, the link right with the with the old paper where they have actually developed this particular uh, um, plasmid and that that you can go through to understand how the people are actually designing the or developing the new plasmids. Uh, so PBR322, uh, PBR322 is a 4359 base pair long plasmid and it has the 40 unique restriction sites. 11 restriction sites are present within the tetracycline resistance genes and 6 sites are present within the ampicillin resistance genes. So it has actually 2 uh, antibiotic resistance genes, tetracycline resistance genes and as well as the ampicillin resistance genes and both of these restriction uh, ampicillin resistance genes or, or the antibiotic resistance genes have the multiple cloning sites. Uh, in addition, the two sites are present within the promoter of the tetracycline resistance genes. Uh, cloning of any DNA fragment into the site will disrupt the resistance genes and as a result it can be used as a criteria for selecting the recombinant plasmids. What is the application of EBR2? It is the most popular plasmid for the cloning purpose. So you can see that there is no promoter. So there is no promoter, so it means it is actually going to be, uh, be a cloning vector. And uh, it is used for studying the transcription as well as the translation of the prokaryotic gene. Uh, it is primarily sourced to design and construct the improved plasmid for the specific activation, which means PBR22 is a basic plasmid and that was very popular and it was very extensively being used for cloning reactions. And it has also been a source for designing the further advanced plasmids such as PUC19. Okay? So PUC19 is the initial example of the bacterial plasmid of a small size, so 2.8 kb. You remember that the PBR32 was 4000 base pair. So containing the multiple cloning site, the usual place to keep the MCS is always been between the initiation codon and the codon 7. And MCS allow design of many cloning strategies as a large number of uh, enzyme available for cloning. In addition, the two enzyme from the multiple cloning site can be used to insert the foreign DNA without disturbing the plasmid sequences. PUC19 vectors also has a small stretch of DNA which encodes for the rapid detection of an insert by the blue white screening. So uh, do not worry about the blue white screening that anyway we are going to discuss in our subsequent reaction or subsequent lectures. Now how you can be able to isolate the plasmids? So First you are going to do is what you are going to do is you are going to transform the um, you know the bacteria with your plasmid which you want to isolate so they will and then you will grow them at a uh, OD of 0 0.6 to 0.8. So once you have this culture right you can actually be able to centrifuge the culture and collect the bacterial pellets. So first you are going to collect the bacterial pellet and then in the step one what you are going to do is the bacterial containing pellet was grown in suitable culture media in a high intensity like 0 0.6 to 0.8. Each bacterial cell contains the chromosomal DNA, plasmid DNA and the cellular protein. The bacterial culture is collected by the centrifugation at the bottom and resuspended in the solution one containing the 50 millimolar glucose, 25 millimolar trace pH 8 and 10 millimolar EDTA. So, in the first step what you are going to do is you are going to pellet down the bacteria, remove the media supernatant and then you will suspend this bacterial pellet into solution 1 which contains the 50 millimolar glucose, 25 millimolar tris and 10 millimolar pH 8. Uh, pH 8. Then in the step 2 you are going to do the alkaline lysis. So, Bacterial cells are treated with the solution 2 containing 0.2 normal NaOH and 1% SDS. So what will happen is that the NaOH is actually going to denature the uh, DNA whereas the uh, SDS is actually going to break open the cells and uh, it, 
so it is actually going to lyse the cells and it's going to denature the DNA, both the chromosomal and as well as the plasmid DNA. Then in the step three, you are going to do renaturation. So in the third step, the denatured DNA is renatured with the solution three containing the potassium acetate, glacial acetic acid, and in this step, small DNA renature back quickly, whereas the chromosomal DNA remain denatured. So this means. Uh, when you are actually going to have the chromosomal DNA and the plasmid DNA into the uh, alkaline lysis method and when you are going to renature the chromosomal DNA is big right. So, it is actually not going to be renatured whereas the plasmid DNA is going to be small uh, compared to the chromosomal DNA. So, it is actually going to renature back and that is how it is going to be present into the solution whereas the chromosomal DNA is going to be present in the pellet. Now what we have to do is we have to do we have to remove the protein because at this stage what we have is we have the plasmid DNA and we have also have the small amount of protein. So what you are going to do is you are going to treat this supernatant with the chloroform and uh, phenol mixture right. So when you do the chloroform and phenol mixture the chloroform and phenol are going to denature the proteins and that is how you are going to remove the protein from this ok. So, protein is going to be present in the pellet and the plasmid is going to be present in the supernatant. So, in the step 4, you are going to do the deproteination. So, resulting uh, supernatant containing plasmid DNA and the protein is treated with the phenol chloroform isoamyl alcohol mixture to remove the protein in the precipitate whereas the plasmid remained in the solution. And in the step 5, you are going to do the alcohol precipitation. So, you add alcohol and that is how the precipitate plasmid is going to be precipitated by the 100 percent alcohol. And once you isolate the plasmid, you are going to see the uh, classical three different forms. You are going to see the covalently circular DNA and if you analyze them onto uh, agarose gel. So, when you isolate the plasmid and you analyze them onto agarose gel, what you are going to see is you are going to see all the three forms onto the plasmid. So, you are going to see the closed circular DNA, you are going to see the open circular DNA and then you are also going to see the super coiled DNA and what you see here this is this is actually the RNA what is also present because when we done this experiment we have not added or we have not removed the RNA otherwise what you can do is you can treat this whole reaction with the RNAs and that is actually going to remove the RNA from the reactions. So, this is all about the plasmid isolations. And we have prepared a small demo clip so that you can be able to more familiar with the different processes. And in this particular demo clip, we have taken care of the manual method and we also have discussed about the uh, kit method as well. Hello everyone, myself Suram Banesh, research scholar at Department of Biosciences Bioengineering, IIT Gauhati. In this video, we will be demonstrating how to isolate plasmid using manual method and how to extract the plasmid DNA using phenyl chloroform extraction method or isoprobenol method. Both the methods we will be uh, demonstrating in this video and also we will show uh, how to analyze the results like uh, what are the different bands you will get after plasmid uh, running analyzing a gel. Hello everyone, in this video we will show you how to isolate plasmid DNA using alkaline lysis method. For preparation of plasmid DNA we need resuspension buffer, lysis buffer and neutralization buffer. In addition to that, we need isopropanol, RNAase and ethanol. Resuspension buffer contains 25 millimolar tris and 10 millimolar EDTA and we have to add RNAase at a final concentration of 100 microgram per ml. Lysis buffer contains 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide and 1 percentage SDS. 
न्यूट्रलाइजेशन बफर कंटेक्स थ्री मोलर पोटाशियम स्टेट पी एच सिक्स पॉइंट फॉर आइसोलेशन ऑफ प्लास्मिक डीएनए वी नीड एटलीस्ट ओवरमेट ग्रोन कल्चर विथ ओडी ऑफ थ्री पॉइंट जीरो सो दिस इज ऑलरेडी कल्चर्ड वन वी हैव टू हार्वेस्ट दि सेल्स बै सैंटिफिकेशन these wells we have to centrifuge 11000 rpm for at least 1 minute to get the cells precipitated now we got the cell pellet we can proceed for alkaline lysis method to isolate plasmid dna in first step we are going to add resuspension buffer which contains rna as a mix thoroughly until all the cells suspended in resuspension solution after the cells got suspended completely now we have to lyse the cells using strong alkaline condition that is 0.2 normal sodium hydroxide and also 1% sodium dodehyl sulfate now we have to gently flip the tube in order to lyse the cells completely we can keep in this condition for up to 5 minutes but not more than 5 minutes which will degrade the plasmid dna and also genomic dna will come out and it will interfere with the mini grid next step we have to neutralize the sodium hydroxide using 
न्यूट्रलाइजेशन पफर टू प्रिवेंट एनी फर्दर डिग्रेडेशन After adding neutralization buffer, you can see there is a white precipitate. That means all the proteins precipitated by neutralization buffer. You can flip the tube two three times, completely precipitate all the remaining proteins. Now, the solution contains solution part contains. Our plasmid DNA and the all the precipitated one contains genomic DNA and also the proteins from bacteria. Now we have to centrifuge this lysate for ten minutes at eleven thousand G. Precipitate got settled. Now we have to transfer the white clear supernatant to another tube. This clear supernatant contains plasmid DNA. Now we have to precipitate this plasmid DNA with the isopropanol, followed by washing with the seventy percent ether. We can see white precipitate in the solution. Now we have to centrifuge it, collect the that white precipitate, and wash with the seventy percent. After precipitating plasmid DNA with the isopropanol. We will get a pellet of plasmid DNA. Now we have to wash that pellet. We wash this pellet with the seventy percent ethanol. Again, centrifuge the pellet. Now we got the pellet. We have to air dry the 
pellet and dissolve it in deionized water or TA buffer. We will keep leave at room temperature till the till the ethanol got evaporated. Next we will add the to easy the process of manual alkaline lysis method. There are several kits available from commercial vendors. The basic difference between alkaline lysis method and the kit based method is kit based method contains silica based columns where lysis lysate which containing plasmid DNA binds through these beads and after washing whatever the unwanted components are there, they will elute out and we will elute the plasmid DNA in TE buffer or water. The composition of the lysis buffer is same as previous uh, method and also neutralization buffer, precession buffer, every buffer contains same composition but in commercial kits we have one extra wash buffer which will remove any unwanted contamination and give pure DNA. We have already seen isopropanol precipitation of plasmid DNA. But there is another method which we can utilize for isolation of plasmid DNA. This is called phenyl chloroform extraction. In this method, once extracting, once uh, recovering this open natant which contains plasmid DNA, we have to mix with the equal portion of phenyl chloroform mixture which is readily available. Once we mix with the phenyl chloroform that since the DNA is more tends to solubilize in water then the DNA remains soluble in water and whatever the other content protein or other materials they go into phenyl based medium. So once we will centrifuge that one and we will collect the water based thing and again we will go for uh, silica based method purification or we can use isopropanol precipitation by washing with the followed by washing with the 70% uh, ethanol. Then again resolubilizing or resuspending it uh, ionized uh, nucleus free water. As we can see, phenyl chloroform, those mixture is high density component, so it will settle uh, bottom portion and the water containing plasmid DNA separated the top one. We will just take out this top portion which is uh, uh, containing plasmid DNA, then we will precipitate with the isopropanol and uh, use for other applications. This is the overall procedure for isolating plasmid DNA from uh, uh, bacterial cells. But we have to remember all the methods having their advantages but we will prefer isopropanol method. In that method we can directly take the uh, plasmid DNA precipitate it but it may contain some of the uh, other uh, other uh, contaminants. For that we need extra silica based method. In this phenyl chloroform based method, here we will precipitating the uh, other than uh, plasmid DNA components, so we will get pure DNA. During this procedure we have to remind that if we don't add 
proper amount of uh, RNAs. Then we can see a band which corresponds to RNA in our agarose gels and uh, comes with the plasmid DNA. So post uh, purification also we can add RNAs and uh, utilize for the application. In this video, we have discussed how to isolate the plasmid using alkaline lysis method. What are the components are required like chemicals and what are the steps like resuspension, uh, lysis and neutralization and uh, their principle behind uh, the lysis neutralization and uh, these things and also two different methods for extracting plasmid like phenyl chloroform extraction and isopropanol extraction with us discuss. So with this we conclude the video and thanks for watching. So after the uh, uh, bacterial plasmid we are going to discuss about the eukaryotic vectors. So within the, within the eukaryotic vectors we are going to have the yeast vectors, we are going to have phase based vector and we are going to have the mammalian vector. So, vector as a extra chromosomal DNA. So, these vectors remains in the eukaryotic cell as a extra chromosomal DNA and they are going to express the protein. So, in the eukaryotic vector, you can have the two different types of vectors. So, vectors which are going to be present as the extra chromosomal DNA. So, these vectors will remain in the eukaryotic cell as the extra chromosomal DNA and they will express the protein. Whereas you can also have the integration vectors. So, these vectors carry an integration site to facilitate the recombination mediated integration into the chromosomal DNA of the cell. This means they are actually going to be a part of the host, part of the host genome. This means if you use the integration vectors, they are actually going to modify the organisms. Whereas this is actually going to be a uh, temporary um, temporary um, modification, right? So that as long as the vector is present in the extra chromosomal DNA, uh, it will going to express the protein. But once the vector is out of the cell, it is not going to express. Whereas in this case, since you have introduced the integration sites, it will actually go through the recombination process and in during utilizing these integration site, it can be a part of the chromosomal DNA of the host cells. So, uh, first we will talk about the yeast vectors. So, these all have the couple of similar features as like MCS, shuttle vectors and all that and the presence of the selection marker. So, there are three different types of yeast vectors which are present. You have the episomal vectors. So, yeast episomal vectors are constructed by the combining the bacterial plasmid either with the yeast to micron origin of replication or with the autonomous replication sequences. One of the such example is the WEP24. Uh, so, used a episomal plasmid or vector uh, 24 where they have taken the bacterial plasmid and as well as the original replication from the yeast. Uh, a representative 2 micron based episomal vector, uh, it is a 6.3 kb plasmid with a copy number in the range of 50 to 100 per cell and these plasmids are much more stable than the autonomous replicating sequences based plasmids. Then you can also have the integrating vectors. So, episomal vectors are present as the ex extra chromosomal DNA and are unstable. This can overcome by the integration of vector into the host chromosome and in the yeast uh, integration occurs by the homologous, homologous recombinations. So, in the yeast integration plasmid contains the target sequence for the integration into the chromosomal DNA selection marker and the bacterial origin of the applications. Before vector delivery to yeast, it is digested with the unique decision endonuclease to produce linear DNA to increase the transformation efficiency and the integrations. In most of the cases, the integration is done in such a way that the yeast chromosomal DNA remain intact and integration may not affect the yeast growth. But in an alternate approach, a portion of the yeast chromosomal DNA is replaced with the vector DNA through the homologous recombinations. 
these vectors are known as the transplant integration vector and they have the foreign DNA selection marker and homologous DNA into the region of chromosomal DNA to be replaced. Then we can also have the third type of vector which is called as a yeast artificial chromosome or YAC vector. So yeast artificial chromosome is the vector of the choice used for cloning very large DNA fragments, right? Remember that when we were talking about the preparation of the human genomic library, we have said that we are going to clone that into the YAC vectors. To prepare the genomic library, YAC vector is like a chromosomal and it has the uh, ARS sequences, centromere sequences and telomeres at the two end to give the stability. It has an ampicillin resistance genes for selection in E. coli and an E. coli origin of replication for the propagation in bacteria. In addition, it has the ARS for replication, SEN for the centromere functions and the URA3 and tryptophan 1 for the selection in the yeast. For cloning, uh, YAC is digested with the enzyme called SM1 and BAMH1. So you are going to digest the YAC with the SM1 and BAMH1 and you are going to treat that with the alkaline phosphatase to generate a linear plasmid. Now foreign DNA is added for the ligation. So at this stage you are going to add the foreign DNA and that is how it is actually going to get inserted into the, these two fragments and the recombinant DNA will allow a yeast to grow on a uracil and tryptophan deficient media, right? So screening anyway we are going to discuss in our subsequent class. And then we have the uh, eukaryotic plasmid, another eukaryotic plasmid where you, which you can use in the insect cell line. So these are the vector for the, uh, for expressing the protein in the insect cell lines and uh, or the baculo vectors, right? So baculo virus is a rod shaped virus infecting the invertebrate including the insect cells. Post infection, the virus is either released as a free viron or many virus particles are trapped in a protein complex known as polyhedron. The protein responsible for trapping the virus into polyhedron is polyhydrin and it helps in the transmission of virus from one host to another, okay? The polyhydrin is not important for virus propagation, but it is under very strong promoter to produce the protein in large quantity. So realizing this fact, the replacement of the polyhydrin gene with a foreign DNA fragment will allow the expression of the protein in a large quantities. So the baculovirus, Autographa California, multiple nuclear uh, polyhedron virus or the ACMPNP, this is what is used as a vector to express the protein. The transfer vector map of the ACPMP is given, right? So this is the vector the map of the AC, ACMNPV where you have the uh, cloning site. This is the cloning site what you have. The gene of interest will be inserted into the cloning site placed adjacent to the promoter. So you have the, uh, this is the polyhedrine gene promoter, right? And it has the polyhedrine termination sequences downstream to the cloning site to stop the transcription of the clone gene and or uh, more will be discussed in future lectures. So this is what you have. You have the ACPNP uh, vector where you have the polyhedrine promoters and next to the promoter you have the cloning site. So within this cloning site you can actually be able to insert the gene of your interest, right? And that's how it is going to start expressing this particular protein instead of the polyhedr polyhedrin. And it also has the termination sequences so that the transcription is going to stop uh, after this. And uh, you can actually be able to take this and put it into the, uh, into the insect cell lines and that's how you're going to express. Then we have the eukaryotic vectors like the mammalian vectors. So large number of excellent mammalian vectors are in circulation to clone the eukaryotic gene for the protein synthesis and to study the transcription mechanisms. It contains a eukaryotic replication of origin from an animal virus such as SV40 from a simian virus, a promoter to derive the expression of foreign gene and the selection marker and the other eukaryotic features such as Cardinal annihilations, transcription termination, etc., etc. So this is what is the uh, mammalian expression vector where you have the multiple cloning site, you have the promoter, and you have the other features of the 
plasmids you can also have the origin of replication for the eukaryotic system you can also have the origin of replication for the bacterial system then you have the antibiotic resistant genes and so on then we have the bacteriophage based vectors so bacteriophage are the virus using the bacteria as their host for replication Bacteriophage lambda is the virus of E. coli and have been used to develop vector for the genetic recombinations. So, what you have is a bacteriophage genome. So, phage genome is a linear double standard DNA of 48.5 kb. On both end of the genome, it has a stretch of 12 nucleotide which are complementary to each other, right. So, you have the two strand, two sites, right, two sites on both end of the genome. One is called as the left cohesive site, the other one is called as the right cohesive site and within this you have the different region of the uh, genome which is uh, expressing for the different part of the body. So, these sites are called as cos sites and it allows the circulation of the viral genome after entering to the host cells. Genes are arranged between these two cohesive sites of the code for the protein responsible for making the head tail factor for recombination and the process of lysogeny. The central region of the genome is non-essential and can be replaced with without much affecting the growth and the infectivity of the virus. As a result, this region can be exploited to develop a cloning vector with multiple approaches. So, uh, how it is actually going to pack the genome? So, the far genome is replicated by a rolling circuit model to produce the long genome whereas cot sites are present on the regular interval, right. So, when it is actually going to produce the uh, far genome into the outside, right and it is actually going to start producing the cos site. So, you can imagine that you have one cos site, you can have another cos site and once this cos two cos sites are going to be out, they are actually going to come together and it will, they will get circularized. The two flanking cos sites and the DNA between them constitute the well viral genome or the monomeric unit. In the presence of head precursor, the long genome is cleaved into the monomeric unit and encapsulated. Nicks are introduced on both the strand of the genome to generate the linear strand to serve as a cohesive site to facilitate the circularization in the host. Okay, so this is what. The bacteriophage lambda cloning vector has a middle segment responsible for the insertion or excision and this region can be replaced with a foreign DNA with the help of the two BMH1 sign present on the either side of the uh, insertion or ex ex excision regions. Lysogeny cycle, lytic cycle and it will form the plaques. So, bacteriophage vect vector are the EMBL3 and EMBL4. So, this is what exactly going to happen, how you are going to insert the uh, foreign DNA into a IE site. Okay. So, this is what uh, all about the different types of vectors uh, what are available for the cloning of the foreign DNA or calling cloning of the uh, enzyme into the um, suitable expression vector. And uh, depending on the uh, production, depending on the origin of that particular gene, you can be able to have the uh, flexibility to choose the different types of uh, vectors, right. You can use the mammalian expression vector, you can use the E. coli expression vectors and so on. Now, once you have chosen the vector, so that is one thing. The second is you have only know the enzyme, then you are actually going to use them together to generate the recombinant DNA. Now, how you are going to do that is you are going to run the parallel multiple reactions. So, what you are going to do is first from the genome, you are actually going to generate or you are going to produce the fragment. So, you are going to produce the fragment, right. Similarly, from the vector, you are going to have the circular vector, okay. This circular vector will have the multiple cloning site and within the multiple cloning site, you are going to introduce your insert. Now, for this fragment, you are going to generate or you are going to produce the restriction enzyme. So, for example, you can treat it with the two restriction enzyme, restriction 1 and 2. So, it is actually going to produce the, uh, you know, the 
the fragments with the cohesive ends so, and these two cohesive ends like for example this is for the restriction enzyme 2 this is for the restriction enzyme 2 1 same is true for the vector also so vector also you are going to digest with the help of this and that right and okay so these are the restriction enzymes so again the same same set of restriction enzyme you are going to use for cutting the vector also then you both took for the ligation reaction okay just now as we have discussed in the previous lecture right and once you put the ligation reaction you are going to have the recombinant dna with your insert into the multiple cloning site okay so this is going to be your chimeric dna or recombinant dna now this chimeric dna you are going to transform into the host okay and the host is going to have this right so host since the this uh, restriction site uh, this plasmid is going to have the origin of replication it is actually going to replicate so uh, depending on the genome depending on the origin uh, organisms from which you are isolating this gene uh, you can be able to choose the different types of vector and depending on what kind of applications if you want the protein or the enzyme in milligram range you might be you, you will good to use the equali system if you want to use uh, the higher uh, level then you can use the yeast expression vectors similarly if the genome is or the organism is um, um, uh, very close to mammalian system then you should use the mammalian expression system or the yeast expression system because that will give you the uh, properly folded proteins so uh, this is all about this uh, you know the cloning of the particular enzyme into the suitable vectors and uh, now you have what you have done is you have generated a recombinant dna right so once you have gen so this is the recombinant dna what you have generated right now once you generated a recombinant dna it has to be transformed into the host and then you are going to use that for the protein production or the enzyme production so in our subsequent lecture uh, we are going to first discuss about how you are going to insert or how you are going to uh, you know uh, devise the different types of strategies to uh, deliver the dna recombinant dna into the host of your choice and subsequent to that we are also going to discuss about the protein production so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here thank you mm -hmm.